Yes. Uh, so the first speaker is going to be Brian Kennedy. So I give the word to Brian. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I have to say that I managed to come down with a stomach virus or food poisoning or something. So I'm going to try to hang in there through my talk, but I may not make it much beyond that. Uh, can you see my slides? Not, not no. yet. Not oh, yet. hold on. I think I forgot to share. It would, uh, it would help. It would help to share. Yes. How about now? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Um, and so I'm going to take you through a little bit about some of the research we're doing, and also um, how we're thinking about doing clinical studies here in Singapore. Uh, particularly once we uh, get up and running, which will be in the next month or two. Uh, the virus is more or less under control here now, but it uh, slowed down the research quite a bit for a while. Um, uh, this is a slide that uh, talks about interventions for aging, and I thought I would start here. Uh, this I stole this from uh, Centara, which is a company thinking about how to uh, tackle the aging process. And I think it nicely illustrates that uh, there are three types of interventions that uh, we're all thinking about. And this uh, inner circle here in dark red is really lifestyle interventions, which are uh, things that I think we know pretty much work already. I think that, for instance, uh, exercise, uh, some, some combination of cardiovascular exercise with resistance training, I think is very, very likely to extend median life expectancy and extend health span. I think we can debate about whether it would affect maximum lifespan. Um, diet, uh, I also think stress management and sleep quality are things that could be manipulated here among others. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of work has been go gone into understanding how these lifestyle changes might affect aging, but the challenge is really getting uh, compliance. Uh, so even if we know what to tell people to do, uh, they, they don't want to really do lifestyle change in a sustainable fashion. And so the question here is really how do you get widespread uh, adoption of any uh, method that any method that you uh, are uh, trying to invoke? Uh, the second uh, circle here is really, I think, where we are now, which is drugs and small molecules, natural products that might impact the aging process. And we're working heavily in this area as, as are a number of investigators that we'll be speaking tonight. Then I think there's this third circle, which is more uh, radical change. Uh, I would put uh, gene therapy, stem cell approaches in there, although maybe they're starting to move into uh, the second circle, I suppose. Uh, but these are things that may have a much bigger effect on aging, but are really not ready for human studies to a large extent at this point. Um, so we're working on a lot of small molecule interventions as I was talking about. And these are ones that we're playing with in the lab at right now, mostly in preclinical clinical models with several of these uh, we wanna do study in human clinical testing as well. And I'll tell you how we're gonna go about doing that. I wanted to just show you some data on alpha ketoglutarate because this is a paper that got recently published it's a natural product that's extremely safe, and it's something that uh, we're excited about testing in humans. Uh, this was uh, sponsored by a company, PDL Health. I won't spend much time talking about it, uh, but um, uh, alpha ketoglutarate has a really a modest effect on survival. So if you start it started at 18 months of age, uh, it extends lifespan in females by up to 10%. In males, it's a smaller effect. Uh, in any one cohort we've done, we don't see significant lifespan extension in males, but we also always see almost the same thing, which is a slight extension. And if you combine the cohorts, you would get statistical significance. Uh, so um, we have uh, four cohorts now, which show pretty much the same thing, um, you know, a black six mice. Uh, they show pretty much the same thing with lifespan extension in females and only a small effect in males. So this is not really why you might get super excited about this. It's an effect, but not a huge one. Um, I should point out before I go on that this was done in large part by Daniel and Nazar uh, in my lab, as well as Gordon Lithgow's lab at the Bach. 
Um, the reason we got excited by this is that it has a much more dramatic effect on frailty. So we think that AKG in mice is compressing morbidity. So if you look here on the left, these are individual frailty scores per mice using, using Susan Howlett's 31-point uh, frailty index that was developed for mice and that corresponds uh, to some extent with human frailty. Um, what you see is that the blue dots go up faster than the uh, pink dots, uh, indicating that the control animals are getting more frail than the AKG-treated animals. But this is a complicated way of looking at this data. Um, this is a every dot is a mouse taken at a different month of age. Uh, but some of the mice are dying throughout the course of this experiment. For instance, this control animal here at 23 months with very high frailty was actually dead by 25 months, so it drops off the curve. So another way of presenting this data is to normalize it based on the lifespan of the animal. So all of these dots, for instance, are taken between 50 and 60% of the lifespan of the animals between 60 and 70, 70 and 80, et cetera. And if you look at it that way, you get a much more coherent observation that uh, frailty goes up pretty steadily in the control animals, uh, but in the AKG treated animals, it's largely flat. In fact, we get a 50% reduction in frailty by, as measured by area under the curve. So this is true in both females and males. And so, um, there's a, the upshot is there's a much more robust effect on frailty than there is on lifespan. So what's alpha ketoglutarate doing? Uh, well, I think it's like a number of small molecules that we've linked to aging. Uh, NAD would be a good example. It's kind of hard to understand mechanistically what uh, it might be doing to affect the aging process uh, because alpha ketoglutarate's in about a thousand chemical reactions. It's also a central metabolite in the citric acid cycle. So uh, narrowing it down to one or two activities is a bit of a challenge. We've shown that it improves adult stem cell function, improves metabolic flexibility, enhances respiration. Um, there are interesting effects on microbiome we don't understand yet. It reduces inflammation. And in human anecdotal data, at least, we see effects on epigenetic clock. But I want to talk about one activity, which is very simple of alpha ketoglutarate, which may be affecting aging. It's something that we might we tend to overlook. And that's uh, 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 the effect of AKG on, on the glutathione production. So if you look up AKG on the internet, you'll find several um, uh, articles. Uh, these are just three that I pulled down showing that alpha ketoglutarate can enhance athletic performance, bodybuilding, uh, uh, healing from injury and wounds, um, which is a major point of muscle uh, strengthening. And so Bodybuilders and, and exercise people have taken AKG for quite some time. Uh, and we were wondering why. Uh, some people think it's because of anabolic activities, but I think there's another activity that may be uh, relevant, and that's uh, glutathione production. So it turns out that red blood cells with uh, uh, deficient mitochondria need to make things like glutathione through different mechanisms. And so unlike most cells, uh, uh, red blood cells can directly take up alpha ketoglutarate um, where it goes in to uh, produce glutamine and then uh, glutathione. And in fact, tracing studies have shown that 89% of the glutamine comes from, uh, glutamate comes from uh, alpha ketoglutarate in red blood cells. And of course, red blood cells need to have a lot of antioxidant defense mechanisms because they're carrying lots of oxygen around to deliver to peripheral tissues. And so uh, what we've been able to see is if you add uh, AKG to red blood cells, you get a pretty robust increase in alpha ketoglutarate either in vitro or in vivo. These are mice treated for a week with alpha ketoglutarate and you can see increases in levels. And so that leads us to a pretty simple model that we're trying to test now. One is that glutathione, well, so just to summarize that part, glutathione decreases with age in red blood cells. Um, unlike many cells, red blood cells readily take up AKG for glutathione production. Uh, their red blood cells are also particularly sensitive to the lack of glutathione. So we think that restoring glutathione levels in these cells uh, uh, probably uh, underlies some of the exercise uh, findings, but also uh, perhaps with aging improves oxygen delivery to muscle 
and that may be one component that affect the aging process. And so there are two clinical studies ongoing now with AKG. Uh, one is sponsored by the company and that the product that from the company actually has vitamins in it too. The male product has low dose vitamin A and the female product has low dose vitamin D. Uh, uh, but this reflects, uh, both of these studies reflect how we're thinking about doing aging uh, clinical approaches. Um, so we're looking at people 45 to 65, uh, relatively small trials, placebo controlled, nine month interventions, and then looking at aging biomarkers and inflammatory markers, in this case, particularly as outcomes, because we saw big effects on anti, big anti-inflammatory effects with AKG in the animals. And then we're doing another study at NUS that will be started hopefully in the next few months, which is similar, except that we're gonna only be looking at the alpha ketoglutarate um, at two different doses to set us because we want to understand more about mechanism from this study, but looking at similar parameters as well as a number of physiologic parameters as well. Um, and I think this brings me to how we're thinking about uh, outcomes for clinical trials. Uh, you know, there's kind of three approaches that have been taken. Taken, a number of companies have taken the approach of trying to take longevity interventions and then trying to treat disease with that. Now that makes sense if you wanna get FDA approval and reimbursement because it's maybe the easiest route to do that. But it's also kind of a sleight of hand. You know, you're developing something that's really having a preventative effect on aging. And then you're trying to uh, find a disease that you can uh, therapeutically treat uh, and to get some sort of outcome. And I feel like that, especially given some recent high profile failures, I, I feel like that we should, if we're gonna to try to study aging, we should try to measure aging as an outcome. And I know that this may be a, a better route to get approval and reimbursement and make money, but I also think that it's, it's not directly looking at what we really care about, which is the aging process. So that leads to two other kinds of studies. Um, the preventative approach, where you really trying to look at health span directly and using aging biomarkers. And you, you all have heard of the TAME trial, of course, you'll hear more about it later. Uh, and I think this is a great study uh, with metformin, the idea to prevent multiple diseases simultaneously uh, to show that you're actually impacting human health span. So I'm very supportive of this approach. It's also a very expensive approach, however, and the trials are long. And so in Singapore, that's really not amenable to us. And so we're taking a different approach using these aging biomarkers. Uh, and we think this is really amenable to lifestyle interventions and natural products, particularly, although we will test drugs in this context as well. Uh, and I, I would admit that some of these modern biomarkers are, while they're not fully validated, I think that I think the, the data on them is, is quite impressive. And so I, I've become a believer in using them to measure aspects of biologic aging. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is to align studies between humans and mice so that instead of looking at survival in mice now, we've switched over to doing six month interventions starting at 18 months of age and using frailty as I've shown you, but and also biologic aging markers as outcomes because these are more similar to the clinical studies we'll be doing in humans. So the idea is that we can take several interventions um, in a relatively agnostic way uh, and work back and forth between the clinical studies and the animal studies, trying to align them as much as possible and trying to learn uh, how correlated these two organisms are in the context of mitigating aging. And then we're also adding mechanistic approaches. In some cases, we do look at disease models and we're working hard with a scientist, Dean Ho here at NUS to look at precision dosing so that we're now doing studies where we might give 30 mice, uh, a, a small molecule like AKG, but we're measuring blood markers along the way and then trying to change the dose in each individual animal to optimize the outcome. And so it's not clear that this is gonna work or not yet, but if it does, we'll try to move these studies into human clinical studies as well, the precision approach, I mean. And so we have a range of things we're measuring uh, this group in the middle are really biomarkers of age, uh, DNA methylation, you know about. Uh, we're using uh, Jackie Han's system in China to generate biologic age from facial reconstruction. Uh, we're generating age from complete blood counts uh, for using uh, some of data from Jero. 
Uh, we're also uh, using uh, metabolomics data and a few other measures like this, uh, partly to see how these different biologic markers correspond to each other in Asian populations. And then we're combining that with more standard measures like arterial stiffness, inflammation, uh, and a few other things as well. And hopefully we're, this will allow us to generate a biologic aging signature in Singapore and use these measures, either individual measures or an integrated measure to determine which interventions are working the best. And so, as I said, it's taken a while to get these studies started. Uh, we would have been underway already for a while if it hadn't been for COVID, but we're uh, pretty much there now. So we should be started in the very near future. Um, and so in Singapore, I, I'll just show one slide. This is highly relevant as 30% of the population is gonna be over the age of 65. The child birth rate in the Chinese population is 1.1 per couple. And so you're, the aging uh, demographics are changing rapidly. And so this is really one of the ground zero places for aging. And so if we can extend health span, I think all of you probably get this. And probably the most important thing is we're gonna dramatically improve life quality and independence late in life. Uh, but we can also extend work years. Singapore, like many countries, is raising retirement age. Um, we can keep the government from having to build hospitals. Uh, and in fact, we've estimated that we can save the government $3 billion just by extending health span three to five years in Singapore. And then finally, what we'd like to do is bring in sort of a, longe a biotech longevity industry into Singapore. And we're in the process of having some impact on that, bringing companies in. And we're actively looking to support um, uh, longevity countries, companies in this area. The government is very uh, supportive with taxes and other forms of non-dilutive financing to bring biotech companies in. So we're working with them on that. So with that, I think I'll just stop and uh, take questions if you have any. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. These are all the, 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 the uh, people in my lab and the collaborators that helped out on the project. And uh, thanks again. Um, okay, thank you uh, for your lecture. Um, so there are quite a few questions that came in. Um, Jos asks, how much uh, alpha ketoglutarate is normally in the human body before supplementation? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's and, and one thing we've noticed is that if you give animals alpha ketoglutarate, it, it doesn't persist for a very long time. So it's, it's not like a drug, I think, in that you need to have it around to inhibit some enzyme. We think we're actually feeding chemical reactions by adding alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, so you, it's like a little bit like NAD. You add a precursor to NAD, it goes up and then goes down really rapidly. And it may be the, the, the reactions it drives that are really having the biggest effect. Um, so it, I, don't, I can't give you an actual quote on how much AKG. There's a lot, of course, because it's, it's a, it's a required component of the TCA cycle. It does go down with age and we can see supplementation when we add labeled AKG. I think what got us uh, confused trying to look at mechanism was that it, the labeled AKG we add doesn't go into a lot of different cell types. And that comes back to a point I alluded to, which is that many cells don't take up AKG directly. And that, that's why we started focusing a little bit on red blood cells. But it also may be that AKG gets converted to to glutamine and that gets converted back to AKG or other things. So we're still trying to sort that out. Okay, a question related to that actually is Nirmu asks what happens to white blood cells? What happens to what? Yeah, when you give alpha ketoglutarate. So is it uh, what, up or... what kind of cells though? I missed your- White blood is... cells. Hold on, let me look at the question. I'm, I'm not, I'm still not understanding you. Um, so, so the question is, uh, what happens white to white blood cells? Blood sorry, blood. sorry, I just sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hang in there tonight. <laughs> um, we haven't looked directly at other uh, white blood cells and other types of lymphocytes in the in the in the uh, in the blood. It, it's not. I don't think that there are active mechanisms to take that up, but uh, it's something we're going back and doing in more detail now because in some of our initial experiments we weren't paying attention to blood cells at all. So. Uh, like for instance, we looked at muscle. We looked at intestine cell, intestinal cells, uh, and muscle cells where there is some AKG uh, taken up when we give it to the animals. 
but things like muscle we, and fat, we didn't see a lot of AKG uptake, but we didn't go, we're now going back and looking at a wider range of cell types. Okay. Uh, I think we have to take one more question and then we are, we have to move on. So uh, Jean asks, uh, what is the, uh, how long is the half-life of alpha ketoglutarate in the blood? And so is it better to take it in small doses throughout the day or one big dose once a day? It's uh, relatively short. The way we give it to the mice is in their food. And so they're eating it all day long. And we think that's important. And actually the company uh, produces alpha ketoglutarate um, in a sustained release format. So it uh, is released more slowly in the intestine uh, based on its uh, formulation in, in the pill form. Uh, and uh, I can't, we, we haven't done side by side comparisons, but we think that may be important to see in the biologic activity. Um, also, I would point out that some, a lot of the AKG you buy on the market is, uh, is uh, bound to arginine or other amino acid analogs. And uh, uh, we were hesitant to add amino acids uh, like arginine because of, we didn't know what the effects on aging might be. Uh, so uh, we haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison with uh, calcium alpha ketoglutarate versus arginine alpha ketoglutarate, however. So, but um, I suspect that uh, some kind of sustained release or, or, or lowered taking it over a longer time frame would be beneficial. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we have to leave it here and go to the next speaker. Thank you so much for your lecture. And if okay. you feel able to, you can answer some more of the questions in the chat. Okay, I'll try to answer a few. Thanks.